afternoon. Thank you for having me. My uh, talk, uh, to some degree, will be focused on Akash. To a great degree, will be focused on a journey. And my uh, sort of recommendations when I talk to young students, especially engineering students, is that solutions that come from adversity. I'd like to run you through my experience, my experience as an entrepreneur, and, and the entrepreneurial experience as an engineer. The most important sort of words of wisdom, as they may be, for students is that adversity shouldn't be discouraging. You know, as engineers, we spell, spend our whole life looking for problems and looking to solve problems. And the biggest difficulty I find in the Indian environment is that people don't embrace failure. You know why Silicon Valley creates more technology and more companies in that, those fields than anywhere else in the world? Because they embrace failure. In India, if you've started two startups and they've failed, you're a failure. In Silicon Valley, if you've started two startups and they've failed, you're considered experienced. It's a big difference there. <clears throat> My father used to tell us, as, as young kids, he used to say, set goals so high that you never achieve them. That just seemed counterintuitive to me. Don't you want to achieve your goals? <laughs> Doesn't that mean that you always fail? And success is relative. You set goals so high that no matter what point you reach or where you started, you succeeded. You persevere. You're going to receive see lots of hurdles along the way, persevere against all odds. So I, I'll lead you through sort of a three-part journey of our entrepreneurial experience. What we started doing, you know, some of the hurdles we came across, and how to solve them. And I know we've got a mixture of people from different parts, so, so I hope this will apply to to all that to think of not just engineering, but think of entrepreneurship and say, you know, how do I apply this uh, in, in my entrepreneurial uh, perspective? Um, my journey started right out of university in 1990. In 1990, there was no internet. Facts with this new and exciting technology, and I was still engineer. I, I graduated in civil engineering. <coughs> And we discovered that nobody made fax machines for engineering documents, for large format, big size construction plans, and, and so on. Nobody made fax machines for such documents. We discovered that we had staff in my father's company that would take drawings, cut them into strips to run them through a fax machine. So to us, that was, it was an obvious solution to it. We decided to create a fax machine. We decided to create a fax machine for large format documents and felt there would be an application of that across the board. It took us about two years and we had a big size fax machine. Fax is a relatively complicated piece of equipment. There's scanning components in there and there are printing components and there's data transmission and communication components in there. And we decided that we would sell these for $20,000. That's the price we came up on. And you need two of them. $40,000 for a pair. And we started off in business trying to sell $40,000 fax machines. And the first six months went by and we sold zero. We couldn't get anybody to buy these big size fax machines. What we discovered was that as an entrepreneur, it's not just innovation from a technology perspective, you've got to look at innovation around the business model, you've got to look at innovation on how you go to market. 
and all of those become important. It's not just the coolest, sexy solution that allows you to take that opportunity forward. And the reality is that the best solutions mostly fail because the other elements aren't there. And the reason most people would give as to why they don't want something of this nature is that, well, overnight is good enough, not worth spending $40,000. But we knew that if we created enough awareness, we'd find the customers. So, so we, we started on this process to try to figure out how do we create awareness for a big size tax machine. We went to the Guest Book of Records. That was our gimmick. We said, we created the world's biggest fax machine. And initially, they said no. Then we sent them a goal over a period of six months, including Fortune's premier issue of the year, uh, the Wall Street Journal did a write up. We just started getting press coverage. We get, started getting so much press coverage, the result of that press coverage was we started getting orders. We started getting orders that we didn't know what to do with. A year and a half, two years later, we took the company public on the NASDAQ, did a small little $10 million size IPO, stocks went up and down, went through the process. But that was the start of our entrepreneurial journey. We were barely four years out of university, and we had just taken our first company public. No venture capital, no external funding, no experience in manufacturing and marketing, hadn't been to an MBA school. My brother had done computer engineering, I had done civil engineering. And we were just a couple of engineers trying to solve problems. The company still exists today, it makes large format scanners and plotters for the CAD CAM industry. And that was the first phase of our journey. The second phase of our journey started actually at the dentist's office. I was sitting in a dentist's office, and I saw an article that I thought was very cool in a magazine in a reception area, and I tore the page out, and I was just about to put it in my pocket, and I looked up and the dentist was standing there, not very happy with me having me tearing pages out of his magazine. <clears throat> It was a very scary moment because I thought now I'm going to be sitting down in a chair with drugs and he's going to have him cooking and going in my mouth. <laughs> he's the wrong person to annoy at the wrong time. So I thought, you know, there's got to be scanners that you can put in your pocket. Right? There's got to be handheld small scanners, something of that sort that I can scan and, and, and do that. But we discovered there was no such thing. They said, oh, it can't be done because, you know, the, the illumination of the page takes too much battery. You've got to have, you know, mechanisms to, to measure uh, distance and other things when, when you scan and so on. And why bother doing something, you know, you had some experience and you got lucky with, with the enterprise in a niche kind of market. Why bother doing something uh, where you're going to create consumer electronics, you're going to go up directly against Sony and HP and, and big consumer electronic companies, and you'll never be able to compete against those guys. We created this product, launched this in 1997. Till today, 15 years later, there's no Chinese competitor to it, and it's still the only one of its type in the world. It's a full page pocket pencil. You swipe it on a piece of paper, scan up 300 pages into memory, has Bluetooth, you can send it as an attachment to your smartphone, you can download it using a USB, a, uh, using a, a micro USB. Wait for exams. <laughs> gadgets that found some very cool applications. This is a full color scan. It has a microprocessor in there, it has flash memory in there, it has a 
LCD screen in there. It has a fiber optic lens array, so I can actually scan business cards and receipts and just carry it in my pocket. The internet killed the fax. And that's why we have to do scanners and plotters. <laughs> Camera phones killed little business card scanners. But at its peak, this was great business. Without a lot of effort, we could sell $18, $20 million worth of these every year. And it was, it was a great business for us. In fact, to me though, the most exciting part of our journey is what we're in the middle of right now. By the year 2000, have shown us that that is truly the case. And if anybody doesn't believe that, you think of the Arab Spring a year ago. Within months, without a lot of bloodshed, a dictator got overthrown by people using Facebook. How powerful is the internet? So the idea was, you've got to be able to do this. At an affordable enough pace. And everybody that was in the wireless internet business said the problem is you can't do it because there's not enough bandwidth and pictures take up a lot of space, and that's why pages are slow, there's not enough processing power, and the usual set of excuses. But our background was only we had been focused on pictures, we knew how to manage pictures. We felt they were wrong. So I came up with a business plan in 2001, and we started finding find patents around Habit. Beyond that, the infrastructure doesn't exist, the electricity doesn't exist. In fact, the funniest one was an op-ed piece I read recently after the launch of the Akash project, where somebody wrote as an editorial, they said, in a country without proper drinking water, why are we wasting time and effort in helping deploy the internet? My opinion is the internet will bring you clean drinking water. Clean or unclean, there's 1.2 billion people in this country that survive and population keeps on growing. You've got to figure out how to raise their standards of living. The funniest to me also was when people say, who teach them how to use it? And I disagree with all the naysayers. In fact, my belief as to why the rickshawala needs the internet is that the rickshawala doesn't want his child to become a rickshawala. It's very simple. You're very privileged to be here because you are students. I have working. You're students in college or university. Very few Indians get to college or university. The reality is that most of the population in this country will never get that far because the quality of education is not there. And we continually see negative reports. 45% of the MBA graduates in 2011 still don't have jobs. 45%. There's studies that come out that tell us 40 to 50% of the engineers that graduate in India are not employable. How scary is that? In fact, this is the problem. If you, I, I, one day I saw my kids on YouTube watching a little video, and they were giggling away, and I, I wanted to see what they were, what they found so funny. And they had searched on YouTube, Indian teacher funny. And if you search Indian teacher funny, the first link you get is this. I thought, how sad is that? 
you think that's the only teacher in India that gives that quality education? What if there are hundreds of millions of kids? What if there are tens of millions of kids getting that quality of education? <coughs> Do you think that the rickshaw wala is happy that a child gets that quality of education? Of course not. What does everybody aspire in this country for? Is to be able to educate their children. Everybody. That is the biggest opportunity. That is why the rickshaw wala needs the internet. Everybody in this country needs the internet. God. Yeah? Who do they need to call? I even had that question. People would ask me. You know the picture with the rickshaw wala at the phone? I used to show that in 2001 and 2002 when I started this venture. And people would say to me, yeah, you doctored up the picture. I've been photoshopped so scared. Ask me about in a phone. <laughs> Today, if the rickshaw wala tells you that he doesn't have a phone, you won't believe it. You'll call him a liar. Trust me, India is going to go from 48 million internet users to 500 million internet users. Not in five years from now, not in four years from now, in three, two, or less. It's going to happen so fast that we're going to wake up one day and say, oh my god, what just happened? That's the opportunity that's here. So we started in this journey. We decided we're going to figure out how to make very, very low cost devices and we're going to figure out how to deliver the internet at a very low cost. We had this technology of delivering the internet on low bandwidth networks. We received a number of patents around this and that's what we were going to go do. We decided to create our first product, a product called the Pocket Surfer the handheld internet device. We launched this in 2004. And when we went to create this product, we needed an LCD screen of a certain size. And nobody made a screen of that size. No, is it a piece of glass? Some electronics to it? Let's go figure it out. How tough is it to make an LCD screen? Seven, eight months later, we designed our own LCD screen. The equipment to manufacture We made our device, we've gone to Mars. Look at what that cell phone does compared to what this does. The retail price of the device that we will offer is 3,000 rupees. And in 3,000 rupees, it's a smartphone and it's an internet device. It plays HD quality video. You can plug in a normal pen drive and watch video. It runs Android, gives you access on Wi-Fi and GPRS. And the reason I know is I own the domains. Uh, and so on. Technology doesn't stand still. Every six months, there will be an iteration and an improvement. The processor will improve, the screen size will improve, other form factors will come in and so on. When we started doing the pocket server devices and, and other devices that we, we wanted to put to market, it wasn't just a device. The device was an acquisition tool, was a way of delivering the internet to our customers. And we tried very hard to deal, do deals with mobile operators who were based in Canada and we were working with mobile operators in the US. And we said, hey, internet, everybody would want the internet in their mobile. And most US operators said, no, we don't believe that. We believe everybody's going to want a phone, and if you can deliver some internet on its cost. That has two benefits. First is we've shifted the burden of memory and processing power from the client device to a backend server. So we can get away with lower processing power, but deliver as rich a web page. Pictures are only 20%. It's not pictures that slow down the web page. Pictures are 20%, text is 5%, 75% of the web page is the instruction set. If you pre-process and pre-render it, and then you compress it, then you can reduce the page by factors 30 to 40 times. <coughs> that means it can go through faster. That means that the cost of internalizing, and from that, they get a cut. So we started analyzing. 
this product today costs us 2,000 rupees to manufacture. We wholesale it to the distributor for 2,500 rupees. We retail it for 3,000 rupees. We make about 500 rupees when we sell this device. The network search software pays us a fee when you use it. We expect over the life of the customer to make about 600 rupees in network services. We expect to make at least another 300 rupees in content and apps and then 600 rupees in advertising. We expect that this device, I can sell it for 9.99 and still make a very healthy profit and not care. The business devices have changed. Look at what Amazon just did in the US. Amazon is not known as a hardware manufacturer. But this year, Amazon is going to outsell Samsung by a factor of three times in the US on tablets. You know why? Because Amazon sells a tablet for $200 called the Amazon Kindle Fire. It costs them $240 to make it. They lose $40 on every tablet that they sell and decide to bid on this tender. I had never done this ever. I had never bid on a tender in my life. I've taken two companies. I talked to IIT Jodhpur and they gave me a letter in writing warning that, by the way, we have a strict deadline on this project. And if you're delayed, we have to charge you 2% of work quality minimum. Means that what they see is the basic app is okay. If it's export quality, if a foreigner is willing to buy it, then you, you know it's got to be good quality. Anywhere else in the world, it would be rude. Nobody would walk into a store that says export quality. Right? In India, it's a selling pitch. <laughs> so, he said there's no such thing as Indian pride. And I disagree. I said, you don't know. There's a new generation. It's changed. That story you must have seen is the old generation. There's a new generation and you don't realize India has changed. And I gave a talk at something called the Asia Society earlier this week in Mumbai. And the talk was about the cost of manufacturing in India. And out of my 45 minute talk, I spent about 40 minutes talking about the cost. And I did 1,000 tablet computers sold in India. In 2011, there was 150,000 tablet computers sold in India. At the end of last year, analysts were saying that the total market for tablet computers in India is between 2.5 lakhs and 5 lakh units. 250,000 to half a million units. That's it. In fact, despite this country having 1.2 billion people, there are less than 10 million computers sold in a year. Laptops, PCs, servers put together in this country are less than 10 million in a full year. What's been our experience? You want to know about Indian pride? Today, we have 32 lakh individual end user pre bookings. We have 40 lakhs of corporate institution and clients. Our current demand is over 7 million units, almost 30 times what people thought the market for tablets, the total market, all the players put together for tablets would be in India. Our current demand. If all we do is fulfill that current demand, that would be almost 70% of the total PC market in India. There's a computing internet revolution that's coming. We're not going to be the only player. There are going to be lots of other players. And if we have that opportunity, the market size is going to be huge. If not in 2012, and certainly by 2013, there will be more tablet computers being sold in this country than PCs. Remember, there are 15 million mobile phones sold every month. <coughs> Only 10 million computers in a full year. 200 million mobile phones sold every year. There's no reason that 15 million, 3,000 rupee tablets don't get sold, especially when they're also a smartphone at the same time. There's a revolution coming, and the opportunity is going to be recognizing how the new internet user is going to use the internet.
and how is that Akshawala's son going to use the internet? What are the apps he's going to take advantage of or she's going to take advantage of? That's where the real opportunity is. Recognizing those and understanding those is going to create the titans of tomorrow. Think of what that future creates. It's going to require visionaries. The revolution's coming. With or without us, it's coming in a big way. This is not just inspired Indians. There's a new government in Thailand. In the last elections, they promised everybody a free tablet. In the last few months, I've been invited to meet with the Prime Minister of Thailand, the President. we have, but if we have, I'd love to take questions, tough questions, easy questions. Marketing strategies. No, here you're right with the marketing strategies. You've talked so, so much about the Akash tablet and you've gone worldwide about the marketing strategy. We have still not seen the uh, uh, actual Akash tablet. So, now we've gone wrong with the supply strategy, right? Yeah. So, so you're 100% right. What happened is we misjudged demand. Because when you looked at what the analyst reports were, okay, the analyst reports were that the market in India would be between 2.5 lakh to 5 lakh units. 